Okay, right now I think we have about 50 people so far, and so I think we could get started. And so we'd just like to welcome you to the webinar we have today, and Jen Braid will be our MC. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on progress toward 50-year lifetime PV modules using different differentiated packaging materials and module architectures. My name is Jen Braid. I'm currently a research assistant professor of materials science at Case Western Reserve University and a visiting researcher at Sandia National Laboratories. I'll be introducing the speakers and moderating the Q&A sessions for today's webinar. This webinar is hosted by the Solar Durability and Lifetime Extension Research Center at Case Western Reserve University. And today we will hear talks on a variety of topics related to the manufacturer, characterization and degradation of PV modules with differentiated packaging and architectures and materials. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. Our speakers include partners from our current DOE funded project to optimize double glass and glass back sheet PV module designs for degradation rate, mechanical durability and cost, as well as experts in PV cell degradation and metrology. We will have two question sessions, one at the end of each hour of the webinar. And please enter your questions into the chat. And if you could include the name of the speaker that you'd like to answer them so they can be answered appropriately. The registrants for today's webinar span all levels of the PV value chain, including research, manufacturing, materials suppliers, and power plant operators from all over the world. As a group, you've indicated a variety of interests with the most popular choices corresponding with industry relevance and trending new module technologies, including bifacial modules and PERC modules. The, this webinar is designed to be informative to the attendees regarding current research in the durability of double glass and glass back sheet modules and also serve as a feedback mechanism to direct our future research in this area. Your engagement in the survey, questions, and feedback after the presentation is incredibly valuable to improving the quality of our work, and we will incorporate your suggestions moving forward in order to make a more highly impactful and industry-relevant body of knowledge in the area of degradation science. So thank you all for your input. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Roger French. Um, who will introduce the Towards 50 Year Lifetime Modules Project. Roger is the Kiyosera Professor in the Case School of Engineering at Case Western Reserve University. He came to CWRU in 2010 after 25 years developing materials at DuPont Company in Wilmington, Delaware. So take it away, Roger. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming to our uh, webinar about our Towards 50 Year Lifetime Modules. And uh, so what I'd like to do first off is just acknowledge uh, the Department of Energy CETO program under our agreement number 8550. In addition, we'll have a presentation by Chris, Chris Davis of University of Central Florida from work that he's been doing in a different CETO project, 8172. And we'll also have Greg Horner of Tau Science discussing uh, the PV characterization tools that we've been using in our system. So the people here are the are in uh, at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, these ones right here at Canadian Solar is another one of our team members. Dupont Company is one of our team members. Uh, people at Cyber Technologies who do the packaging materials, and also at NREL Nick Bosco. So this about uh, this towards fifty project that we have. We're just in the. Uh, uh, a little bit before the halfway point. And what we've been doing is wanting to identify strategies to extend the module lifetime to 50 years by figuring out how to reduce the power degradation rate to 0.2% per year by relying on improved packaging materials and module architecture. So that would be comparing discussion of glass back sheet modules versus double glass modules. These are all in service to get to the uh, three cents a kilowatt hour sunshot goal for 2030. The proposed work that we have actually involves both fabrication of mini modules, MMs, which is done by both Canadian Solar and Case Western Reserve University. 
the packaging materials from Cybrid, uh, Weibel analysis and FEM of cell and mini module fracture uh, done by NREL, exposures, stepwise evaluations at case, data analysis, and cross correlation. So, our real objectives are using these four cell mini modules to uh, optimize double glass and glass back sheet design based on degradation rates, mechanical durability, quantify the degradation modes in these and see if there are differences between them and be able to cross correlate between the outdoor and the indoor results. So we'll be showing you the results to date in our project, uh, but of course the project isn't over, we're just in the midpoint. Uh, so we've been fabricating mini modules here. There's actually two different geometries because of the four point loading that we do. We do exposures and stepwise evaluations. So this would be the four point fit loading of the uh, four cell mini modules. This is our ELPL system that uh, was developed with Tau Science. We then get into our data analysis and modeling and then cross correlation of the indoor and outdoor. So one of the things that's gonna be unusual is that this is a, a statistically designed study protocol. So for example, looking here at the uh, mini modules that we're doing, for example, for indoor exposure or outdoor exposure, there are four different sets and there are then in set one, which is what we have results to report on today, uh, there are four different variants in set one, and there are six made by uh, SDLE and six made by Canadian Solar. So that means that we actually have variants of who built the mini modules, are they double glass or glass back sheet? Did they use EVA or POE? In this program, we're using all multi-crystalline silicon uh, perk cells, and these are mono and bifacial cells. And so what we actually do in our study protocols is that we take these 20 total mini module variants, that's five uh, different sets of mini modules over here, and four variants per set, that would be the versions one, two, three, four. And we then go looking at the samples of these, so there's 12 samples of each variant, six from CSI, six from CASE, we deploy them outdoors and indoors, and then use common characterization tools across the indoor and outdoor exposures. So what we have is that these variations and these small sets of six or 12 uh, samples of each variant are ones that set us up to be able to do uh, statistically inform, have statistically informed uh, findings instead of just uh, one-off observations. So in the set one, we're looking in monofacial multi-silicon perk with uh, transparent EVA and POE. The back cutoff is the UV cutoff encapsulated behind the cells, glass back sheet and double glass, and the numbers right here. And the indoor exposures that we're doing are modified damp heat or modified damp heat with full spectrum light. So these basically mean that we've designed the number of mini modules to be uh, set to be able to get statistically significant results. Out of those 48 mini modules in a set, we actually make square ones, 32 versus 16 to enable the cell mechanics work. Okay, we also take another step here in terms of the data handling that we string and tab the cells in the mini modules so that we can measure both the string of four cells and we can measure each cell individually. So you can actually get five electrical measurements out of each mini module, each step of the way. We then measure them at baseline and at five steps through time. So in the indoor exposures, we'll have six time points overall. Whereas outdoors, it's easier that we can take literal time series IV and PMP scans, where we scan the IV curve every 10 minutes and we get a PMP every minute. So the fabrication, for example, here at case is done with our laminator here. This is the geometry of how we're wiring them up with these one wire uh, junction boxes. So we can connect to the full string of four or we can do each cell individually. And in addition, in the cell mechanics part to look at sensitivity to cell fracture, we made 121 cell mini modules. And again, we have oriented the bus bars and grid lines differently. The exposures that we're doing here are all with modified damp heat where we're only heating to 80 degrees centigrade. And this is chosen so as to be below the uh, glass transition temperature of PET and to therefore avoid some of the aggressive corrosion 
that is really only seen in uh, uh, full damp heat at 85C, 85% relative humidity. In addition, when we do the modified damp heat in full spectrum light, instead of a UV light exposure, this is full spectrum light, about 420 watts per meter squared of radiance, so 0.4 suns. So that means that we will have current flowing through the mini modules during exposure. And then we do five exposure steps in total for about 2,500 hours. So it takes us about four months to go through a set. Here's what the outdoor setup looks like, and we'll be seeing results from the outdoor and indoor later on in the webinar. And so these are all the mini modules set up here. And then in this box, we have our uh, Daystar uh, controller and load units. So these are being exposed at our Sun Farm on campus. And uh, we've got so far nine months going, and we're collecting our time series data. So we can collect similar data on paired modules indoors and outdoors. Characterization, as I said, so Spire Solar Simulator, the Sinton Suns VLC, our EL and PL camera system, and the four point loading for cell mechanics to look at the cell cracking possibility. And we do all baseline measurements initially before exposure, and then take them stepwise through time. In addition, out of the approaches that we take, we've developed a number of different software packages that are available to people in the community. So one for identifying what Copen Geiger climate zone you're in, uh, is structural equation modeling, so NetSEM for SMR models, uh, data-driven IV feature extraction, uh, SUNS VOC from the time series IV curves, this just published in June. Uh, there's another one that's on uh, PV image, and so this is for image processing of EL images, and PV PLR is in review right now with CRAN, and that's for calculating performance loss rate. In addition, we have a set of uh, open data sets available to anyone on our SDLE OSF page, and those include both time series data from the DOE RTC systems and also EL images. So as we go through today's webinar, we'll see more results and hear more about it. I hope you enjoy. Great, thanks Roger. So our next speaker is Kunal Roth, who will give us an overview of current PV module warranties. And Kunal is currently a PhD candidate in the Macromolecular Science Department at Case Western. Kunal? Thanks, Jen. Um, looking at what the warranties that exist in uh, the companies that are producing the most up-to-date modules is useful to give us a, an, an idea of connecting um, economics with updates in technology. Uh, can we go to the next slide? There's, so there are a few different types of warranties that companies um, uh, will uh, identify. And so these give us different types of information about um, the module technology. Product warranties are standard, uh, more or less, uh, amongst the industry because they deal with the actual components of solar panels failing and replacing um, product failures. So this is pretty uh, similar across any other kind of industry that would offer warranties on their products. Performance warranties are particularly interesting to us because they deal with long-term degradation of the product. So these are um, values that companies will um, guarantee for power performance, um, power production, in the first year and um, over the course of the life of the module. Labor warranties are also interesting to look at, I'm sorry, um, because we can see and we are seeing more often uh, nowadays that companies are noticing that the uh, method by which um, PV systems are set up and installed is a significant impact on their lifetime. Next slide. So this is a list of some of the most up-to-date modules um, offered by companies today. And so we can see the um, products offered in uh, the years 2017 and 18 compared to the products offered now. And so the two types of updates that we see, um, we can see with companies like SunPower and REC, um, the main update that they have is a change in cell technology, um, usually coupled by a change in module design. Whereas we can also see with a company like Hanwha, the main thing that they update is um, their product warranty while they're using the same cells and more or less the same module design, which we can see in the next table um, on the next slide. 
So here, um, the Hanwha QPeak Duo Black G6 Plus is the most up-to-date model that they um, have for their quantum cells. And though they're using the same kind of monocrystalline quantum cell technology, they've updated their product warranty to be competitive in the market. So that's more of an economic decision. Um, in terms of uh, the effective technology on impacting these warranties, we can see the RAC and SunPower most recent um, updates bring their annual uh, loss percent in performance, uh, their performance loss ratio to be about 0.25%. And so these numbers are extremely important to us, especially considering this kind of project, because um, these are the numbers that represent that approaching 50 years as a lifetime for modules is a realistic goal. Next slide. So there are a few unique things to notice about these different um, major companies and in the ways that they offer their warranties and the ways that they've updated their warranties over the years. So SunPower um, is, boasts the strongest warranties of most of the um, modules that exist in the market. They talk about their unique connection strategies and how that um, improves their degradation time. Uh, Hanwha bases their warranties off of their cell technology. And so they use similar uh, warranties across different kinds of cells, even across different kinds of module designs. And that's um, the strategy that many companies use. But um, companies like CSI, based their warranty specifically on the cell type and the module design and all the different factors that go into um, module production. So we see many different kinds of highly specific warranties for the different products that they produce. Next slide. And REC offers, um, this goes back to talking about labor warranties, an interesting table um, where they compare the warranties that they offer if you use any installer versus installers that are certified by REC. And this is something that's important to notice because uh, perk cells in particular uh, show a, a greater um, loss in performance over the first year as compared to following years. And although we know that that is related to the, um, the degradation that occurs in perk cells, it can also be significantly correlated to um, the experience of the installers when putting in the panels to begin with. So that could be a potential um, area in which to decrease the first year degradation. Next slide. So looking back, um, the ITRPV International Roadmap for Technology showed, um, these are their predicted uh, decreases um, in warranty, or sorry, decreases in degradation and increase in warranty um, as we approach 2030. And we can see that uh, a pretty significant trend that they seem to predict is that um, they think that degradation per year um, is going to sort of plateau at 0.5%. And so that number already we've, we're seeing isn't necessarily accurate by um, some powers A, E, and X series modules and REC's heterojunction technology modules where they're um, saying that their degradation percent uh, annual loss is around 0.2% or 0.25%. Next slide. So here are some uh, results from last year when uh, we did this kind of warranty study. So this is comparing different kinds of cells. And so we can see um, that the first year degradation values um, more or less match what we see today. Um, so 97 to 97.5% of nameplate power after the first year. Um, and then we're seeing this annual degradation of about 0.5% annual loss, which is what ITRPV um, is reporting uh, at, as the sort of plateau value. And so that matches the idea of a 25 year product warranty or 25 year performance warranty um, because 0.5% per year will um, end up with uh, uh, an average or a, a lifespan of about 25 years. So we wanna cut that number in half to get it to 50 years. Next slide. Um, so this shows that the companies in 2020 are seemingly able to do that um, mostly with uh, changes in their actual cell technology. So SunPower and RAC um, with their updates in their module design are able to achieve those numbers of 0.2 or 0.25% uh, annual loss. Whereas Hanwha, which is using the same cells um, is seeing the same kind of percent loss per year though they have updated their product warranty. Next slide. And so in terms of first year performance loss, we're still seeing more or less the same kinds of values that we would see um, in 2019 or 2018 or 2017. 
um, where companies are still promising about 97 to 97.5% of their nameplate power after the first year. Um, but this idea of um, installation having a significant impact on power, especially in the first year, um, could be uh, a, a way by which this value can be decreased without necessarily um, having to improve the technology that's present in the cells. So that's uh, a general overview of where warranties stand in the PV industry today. Great, thanks, Canal. Our next speaker is Laura Bruckman of Case Western. She will discuss the current PV market share of glass backsheet and double glass modules. Laura is an associate research professor in the Department of Material Science, developing predictive lifetime models for materials degradation related to stress conditions and induced degradation mechanisms evaluated by quantitative spe spectroscopic characterization of materials. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. So next slide. Um, so this section, we're going to talk a little bit about the direction of PV modules as a whole as we move from glass backsheet modules to glass glass sales. Um, this graph comes from Canadian Solar, who is a partner on our project. And this talks a little bit about what they're seeing in their current and previous sales. So the table shows the sales of percentage sales of glass backsheets versus glass glass modules. And as you can see from 2019 to early 2020, most of the modules sold their glass back sheet. What they've seen recently and their sales is that their new products um, have switch percentages where now they're selling a majority of glass glass modules with less glass back sheet modules. And this happened quickly. So the change was very, very quickly. And they see this as also something that will continue to happen just because as we make larger and larger modules, larger wafers. Um, the glass glass design allows for a little more mechanical reliability for these modules, therefore making the glass glass back, um, modules the chosen um, design. Next slide. Um, so this comes again from this international technology roadmap for PV. Um, so these four glass will graphs will start in the left hand top quadrant um, talks about the difference between full cells in blue and then half cells in yellow. And as we move to 2030, um, they see that, that we start increasing in half cells. Um, so that we're gonna have different types of cell technology as we move closer and closer and kind of decrease the amount of full cell modules created. Um, as we move to the right hand top quadrant, um, what we see there is that perk cells begin in 2027 to basically be the only cell technology or completely reduced ALBSF cells. So we're removing ALBSF cells from the sales and going completely to perk. And then we have some more increase of these other type of technologies like heterojunction cells, um, and some back contact cells. So the new technologies are gonna start increasing, but we'll basically majority will be perk cells. Um, on the left-hand bottom quadrant, we are talking about bus bars. So basically in 2000, after 2020, there's no longer gonna be these three and four bus bar modules. And we will be moving to six plus bus bars, um, which is in the yellow. But that will also be decreasing as we start having, or five bus bars will start decreasing. We're going to move to six bus bars in gray. And then there are also going to be things like shingled cell or multi-wire technology increasing through time. So the way that we're stringing these cells together is changing along with cell technology. And then our last graph in blue, it looks at EVA as an encapsulant. Right now that's been the dominant encapsulant for decades. Um, what you can see here is there's a much slower change from um, EVA than in anything else we've seen to uh, polyolefin, which is what's predicted to be the uh, encapsulant that's going to take about 30 or so percentage of the market in 2030. 
and then there'll be some additional fat encapsulants that are not quite there yet, um, but we'll still be seeing a majority of EVA in 10 years. Next slide. And then this talks about the difference between glass back sheet versus glass glass. So the T50 project focuses on a lot, what's the difference in degradation between these two types of modules. And what we see here by 2030 is that there will be a 30% market for glass glass modules. Um, however, industry often hits these roadmaps much earlier. So we can potentially see a larger market share of glass back sheets in our future. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Laura. And next, Bill Gamboji of DuPont will tell us about transparent back sheets using clear Tedlar PVF films. Bill is a technical fellow with the DuPont photovoltaic and advanced materials business. His work focuses on photovoltaic materials and their impact on PV performance and durability. Bill has worked at DuPont for more than 30 years and has been involved in several new product developments in the areas of optical, electronic, and optoelectronic materials and devices. He has contributed to over 30 patents and more than 30 technical publications and regularly delivers technical presentations on reliability issues in photovoltaics at international technical conferences. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Jennifer. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, discuss transparent back sheets uh, using TEDLAR films. These are our back sheets that we have uh, contributed into this program. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on the, the performance of those back sheets. Next slide. So a lot of people are familiar with uh, uh, white back sheets and TEDLAR back sheets that have been in the field for 30 years. Uh, not many people uh, know that uh, transparent back sheets have actually been in the field for almost 20 years. Here you see an example uh, from uh, a building in Amsterdam. They've mostly been used in BIPV type applications. Uh, we continue to look through our field program uh, at the performance of transparent back sheets in the field. Uh, but for this particular uh, um, installation, we saw no particular issues related to the back sheet. Uh, so that's encouraging. Next slide. A little bit about uh, what the advantages of a glass back sheet uh, a module are. Uh, so clear Tedlar has a very high light transmittance. It has, as, as we showed there, long-term uh, field proven uh, performance, has uh, excellent weathering resistance, long-term UV protection, uh, excellent mechanical properties, which are needed to uh, uh, avoid uh, failures in the back sheet. Uh, Anti-soiling and easy cleaning, uh, salt mist uh, and chemical resistance and sand abrasion resistance. I'll be showing you some data on these. Next slide. Uh, here is the, uh, the uh, PVF film, the performance of the PVF film. It has high uh, transmittance in the, uh, in the wavelengths in the visible where the silicon cells are sensitive, has low transmittance in the region where the PET could be damaged by UV. So it has high transparency, uh, good mechanical properties, and uh, uh, excellent UV protection of the PET core. Uh, next slide. Here you see the performance of the film. Uh, you see its UV absorbance, the stability of UV absorbance. It has stable color when exposed to UV. These are exposures under xenon arc. Uh, it maintains its mechanical properties, so it's not going to crack and uh, has solar li uh, has stable light transmittance, so you have uh, high power on the uh, bifacial module. Next slide, please. There's this, uh, uh, a representative structure, so it's TEDLAR, transparent TEDLAR on the backside, uh, a core PET film and a coating on the inner layer. Here you see the performance of the back sheet, uh, high optical transmittance and very little change in uh, in yellowness. Next slide, please. Here's an, an example of uh, stable mechanical property. So on the upper part, you see uh, exposures to UVA out to beyond what would be reasonable for a 30-year product for a bifacial module, out above 400 uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared. And the elongation is stable. 
elongation is also stable out to 3,000 hours uh, in the chart uh, at the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, one of the considerations is mechanical properties for a backsheet. Uh, we have seen in the field PBDF, for example, cracking uh, out at anywhere from five to 10 years. Here's some examples of PBDF. The, the issue there is the TT elongation. Uh, so we've looked at four different uh, PBDFs, actually over a range of temperatures down to minus 40 degrees C. And uh, what you see is, well, very low, uh, TD elongation, uh, even at a room temperature, but down to 40 degrees C, it, it continues to drop uh, while the Tedlar maintains that, those properties. So that's important in uh, lots of applications where the temperature is varying significantly. Next slide. Uh, we've looked at uh, other material, other transparent back sheets, um, and this, this is at a highly accelerated uh, metal halide exposure, and we see for other materials, not such good stability in terms of mechanicals and color. So that's a that's a concern. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's some information on uh, dirt detergent and salt resistance. So we've done testing by standard ASTM methods and seen good performance for the Tedlar uh, uh, film. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also see uh, excellent solvent resistance for Tedlar. There you see a comparison of uh, a Tedlar-based backsheet, uh, an FEVE coating-based backsheet, and PET, and uh, uh, very good resistance for, uh, for cleaning. That could be important in manufacturing and for uh, cleaning in the field. Next slide, please. Uh, there is some concern um, about abrasion resistance. So here we look at uh, a falling sand type uh, exposure and compare to other um, transparent back sheets. So you see um, very little change in light uh, transmittance for the Tedlar base back sheet, um, some loss in, in both FEVE and PET. And uh, the volume for sand wear out uh, is high for the transparent back sheet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of performance in uh, bifacial modules, here you see uh, uh, data from a tier one module manufacturer where they've gone out to 600 thermal cycles. Again, they're looking at the front and the back side performance. Um, they're going out to 3,000 hours in damp heat, uh, going to three times the uh, IEC qualification uh, requirement for TCHF, and then going out to 192 hours for PID all of them well within the uh, range that is uh, uh, expected for qualification. Uh, next slide. We've also looked at uh, commercial um, uh, glass glass and glass back sheet modules uh, in terms of their uh, resistance to PID. So here we've gone out to 96, 192, and 384 hours of PID uh, stress, uh, minus 1,500 volts at 85 and 85. Uh, we've looked at the front and the back and looked at modules. These are 60-cell uh, modules that are um, made from exactly the same bomb, the only difference being a back sheet versus uh, glass. This was 2.5-millimeter glass. And what we saw was a, a significant difference, particularly on the back side, for glass-glass uh, -glass modules, more loss in glass-glass -glass modules on the back side due to PID. Um, these were also all uh, using PoE encapsulants. So PoE uh, will not will not completely uh, uh, eliminate the PID issue in uh, in glass glass modules. Next slide, please. Uh, we've also applied our uh, mast testing. It's a sequence of damp heat, UV, and thermal cycling. We've used it effectively to predict backsheet performance in the field and identified uh, the issues with AAA and with uh, PVDF in the field. Um, we have also applied it toward our uh, uh, transparent Tedlar back sheet and seen good performance uh, under that stress condition. Uh, that this, this methodology is also being adopted in a modified form in, in IEC to identify back sheet issues. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, the risk with glass glass, uh, the main risk that we've seen has been um, uh, delamination. So the glass glass structure can entrap uh, ma uh, materials and lose uh, adhesion. So uh, here's some examples. And we, again, through our field program, we continue to look for understanding of how glass glass is performing in the field. It's a, it's a, rel it's a relatively, in terms of high volume, relatively recently adopted. So there's issues there. Next slide. Uh, we've also looked at performance in the field. Here is, uh, again, from a tier one manufacturer, we're seeing uh, appreciable differences in performance in the field. Uh, these are four different installations. And again, we're seeing higher, uh, higher performance with the glass back sheet. Uh, we think it's because of lower temperatures. So we're going out there and confirming that through modeling and through measurement. Next slide, please. And here you see the, this, the same uh, um, one, one example of a field and tracking it over, the, over time, uh, showing 0.83% more rear side power uh, output than uh, in the glass back sheet version. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the main uh, uh, improvement of glass back sheet and the main driver, one, one of the main drivers of glass back sheet is its lighter weight. So you see significant differences uh, between glass glass and glass back sheet in weight. Uh, and as the modules get bigger, that problem becomes larger. Uh, next slide, please. So just to sum up um, uh, what we see for glass, uh, for uh, transparent back sheet, it has a proven module structure. It has higher power output. It has lower installation uh, because of its because of the lighter uh, uh, lighter weight, and it's a mature manufacturing process, so there isn't as much modification needed in manufacturing. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to questions. Thanks. Great, thank you, Bill. And that's a good reminder that we have a Q&A session coming up, so please enter your questions into the chat. And now Chris Davis will discuss manufacturing defects, failure modes, and degradation mechanisms in ALBSF and PERC modules. Chris is an assistant professor of material science and engineering at the University of Central Florida with secondary joint appointments in the College of Optics and Photonics, the Florida Solar Energy Center, and the RISES FET cluster for energy research. His research is focused on the development of new materials, manufacturing processes, and characterization techniques to improve PV technologies and speed up the adoption of solar energy as a global energy source. This work is currently supported through multiple funding awards from the U.S. Department of Energy and from industry. Thanks, Chris. Take it away. Thanks, Jim. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, sound, sound good. Great. Thanks. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about some uh, different, you know, manufacturing defects uh, and kind of reliability issues that we've observed quite a bit. Um, on cells and modules that we've characterized here at, here at UCF. And, and particularly, I'm going to focus on some, especially those kind of defects that you can easily identify with things like EL imaging and show some of the signatures of those in some of these images. Next slide, please. So, of course, as you know, um, you know, throughout this webinar, we've been discussing the entire supply chain. And, you know, there's, there's things that can arise, you know, um, you know, early upstream that can cause reliability and durability is issues, as well as those that, of course, can that are a bit more obvious that can that, that can occur further downstream. Um, so today, I'll, I'll kind of highlight a, a few problems that kind of occur at kind of the wafer level. So kind of more of that, um, you know, feedstock crystallization and wafering, um, and then I'll spend most of the time talking about issues that can arise kind of at the cell level. Um, and then I'll highlight a couple of examples of things at the module level. Next slide. So I kind of have a, a, a table to that, that I kind of put together to kind of organize my thoughts on this. And so I'll basically walk through and, and try to highlight, um, you know, the specific defect or failure mode, its, its point of origin, you know, in terms of its position in the supply chain, how it influences the IV and, and Sun's VOC curves, and then 
you know, whether, whether I think that there's much risk associated with that specific defect in terms of the reliability, right? Because there's some defects that will, of course, affect the seller module, you know, when you do the, the flash testing on the manufacturing floor, but then they may not actually be a problem once you put it in the field, like kind of what that point at t equals zero, that, that's, that's all you have to worry about. But there's others that may, um, you know, they may not have much of effect you know, initially, but then over time, that can be more of a problem. It's, it's a bit subjective and, and we're still working through this. So any feedback would be much appreciated. Next slide. And so I'll talk a bit about, of course, you know, it, the influence of these de defects on the IV or JV curve um, and highlighting a specifically, you know, whether or not it affects, you know, like the JSC or VOC or the fill factor. And of course, you know, the, the, the hope is to keep all three of these high so you can keep the efficiency of the seller module high. Next slide. And one of the things we try to do is basically try to break down, you know, different losses and efficiency to either optical losses, resistive losses, or recombination losses. And we do that by a combination of different imaging methods. Uh, so we use a lot of, um, you know, QE mapping and reflectance mapping to look at particularly optical losses, but also to some extent recombination losses, uh, because uh, you know optical losses really you know affect the short circuit current, but recombination losses kind of can affect all parts of the IV curve. Um, and then to look at recombination losses uh, with a little more detail, we use like open circuit PL imaging, uh, which doesn't really have resistive effects, but but can easily highlight recombination problems. And then either electroluminescence or biased photoluminescence, where you're doing photoluminescence imaging, but you're also pulling current from the, the seller module, that can be very valuable in, in identifying kind of resistive losses and things like that. So we use a combination of different luminescence imaging techniques and this kind of QE mapping to try and figure out what the actual loss mechanism is. Because if you have that coupled with the, the actual image itself, you can often trace the problem to a root cause. Sometimes it's not always the case, but often that can be very helpful. Next slide. So starting at upstream with the kind of the wafers and cells, um, there's of course multi and mono, and there's a number of different defects and failure modes. Um, some of those are, are, are quite well known and, and you know, things like dislocations and hybrid combination grain boundaries. And those of course affect the VOC of the cell um, but ultimately, I don't, I don't, I think most people would agree there's not a whole lot of risk that those are going to be reliability, reliability issues in the long term. Um, in the case of, you know, Chakrosky wafers, you have oxidation induced uh, stacking faults, oxygen induced stacking faults, which show up as like these kind of ring structures, which again can affect the efficiency, but, you know, it's not clear whether those are really a reliability issue or more of just like kind of a manufacturing issue. And then you have, um, you know, two defects that are, very much a reliability issue, light-induced degradation, which has been studied for a, you know a long time. There's a lot of different ways to do you know repassivation, regeneration processes to kind of address that, as well as things like uh, light and elevated temperature-induced degradation, lead ID or, or carrier-induced degradation, and that's a, obviously an active area of research. So a lot of a lot of that's going into that. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So here's an example of like a, a multi ALBF BSF cell where you can clearly see a bunch of these dislocation centers that I've kind of highlighted here um, that you see in the PL, which corresponds directly. So we basically generate these VOC images from the PL images. And then also using the kind of the QE mapping, you can see that they also affect the, the JSC as well. So the, those recombination centers affect both. And if you go to the next slide, it looks like the figure got kind of uh, messed up here, but uh, but essentially, um, what you'll see is that the 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 base loss is where this shows up. So if you do like the QE analysis, it ultimately it doesn't you know it doesn't show up in the emitter loss. It just shows up in the diffusion length and and in the, the J loss B. So next slide. Oxygen induced stacking faults. Those also have kind of a a clear signature that's that's easily visible, easily uh, identifiable. Um, it shows up as these rings, but again, I don't think this is really a reliability risk. Um, I, you know, I'm happy to hear more if that is the case, but it's something that that you'll often see in in, in uh, different CZ uh, types of wafers. Um, in terms of LID and LED ID, those those are kind of tricky because, as far as I'm aware of, there's there's no real obvious signature 
if you if you just get a seller module and you try to collect PL, you know, it's more of something that is related to the the history of that cell module in terms of the the thermal history and its exposure to light and temperature, you know, different sequences and again the activation of defects and then the repassivation of those defects. So that one's a bit more challenging. So I'd be curious of any of the people listening if there are ways that you can kind of easily identify this, but it seems to be something that that you can't really just pick up just from a, a specific PL or EL image of a cell. Uh, going to the next next slide, please. So the other kind of uh, common failure mode that's been studied uh, quite a bit are, are, are shunts and, and junction kind of pre-breakdown. And so those, those can be an issue. And so that essentially is where you have like a current path through the junction. Um, and so that, that can be the case in both you know, multi ALBSF as well as mono ALBSF as well as perk cells, really any kind of cell that has a junction. But it's especially, you know, uh, an issue when you have high temperature screen printed paste that etch through a dielectric and can actually um, consume some of the junction and, and punch through. So if you go to the next slide. So we have some examples here. It looks like this figure got, got messed up here on the left, but, but essentially these are different types of shunts. And so um, you can see at least the DLIT image where it shows like kind of a shunt here. And this was done in collaboration with NREL. But what we showed in this was essentially you have like uh, these shunts do show up in the, the PL and as well as the, um, the open circuit voltage image as well as the JSC image. But if you really want to have a, a good detailed look at, you know, these kind of issues, thermography is a good way to go. And on, on the right, you can see um, examples of thermal images that we got from Tau Science, where you have the case of what I mentioned before with the overfiring, where you essentially have the, the silver paste, uh, you know, as it consumes the silicon nitride dielectric, but then it continues to consume some of the silicon. And if you overfire too much, it can punch right through the junction. That can be a problem. Another uh, manufacturing, uh, you know, kind of defect that you can observe is poor edge isolation. Uh, so often with like a diffusion process, it'll wrap around to the, to the rear side of the cell, which you have to deal with that because, of course, that, that provides a similar kind of current path to, to the, the rear contact. So you have to do edge isolation. If that's not done properly, you can see that will show up in, in the, the edge. Next slide. So another one is, is cell passivation. Um, and so there's, there's different ways that the front and rear surface passivation can be, um, you know, can, can, can have issues. So you can have poor emitter passivation. That's, that's typically in the case of these kind of P-type cell architectures like ALBS and PERC, that would be a silicon nitride coating on the front. Um, so there's issues that can happen during manufacturing and there's potential issues that can happen uh, as these cells and modules are operating in the field, whether it's related to kind of UV degradation or damp heat or some work that's been, that's been shown like Peter Hackey and his team have shown that PID can actually, you can, if you have really bad cases of that, you can get corrosion of the, the uh, kind of front ARC and passivation layer, which can, can clearly be a problem. Um, and there's also, of course, potential induced degradation and shunting, which also seems to be related to the, to the front surface passivation. So sometimes that can be an issue where the, the fixed charge is, is changing at the surface and the fixed charge is important because it, it controls the, um, the minority carrier concentration near that interface. And you can have other situations where the actual chemical passivation, the interface defect density is changing. So just depending on the mechanism, you know, there can be different ways in which this can unfold. And this is another one that's an active area of research that we're actually working on right now with, with Roger and his team at Case Western and Canadian Solar as well. If you go to the next slide. You can kind of see an example of this, uh, just kind of poor rear surface passivation in the case of a perk cell. So this is a, a mono perk cell here. So we have the PL image, which we converted to a VOC image. And you can see on the top, there's like kind of this dark region um, that is, is likely related to uh, the surface preparation and then the kind of oxide nitride deposition on the rear side. And so it, of course, also shows up in the, the JSC due to the kind of the optoelectronic reciprocity. So things that affect, uh, you know, the VOC will often affect the JSC as well. And then if you uh, do the analysis of the QE at each point, you can actually separate this into like the, you know, whether it's recombination at the front or the rear. And in this case, it does show up as a rear recombination thing, confirming that it's on the rear side. Uh, so that, that's one way to do that. Um, and so, um, you know, this is one of those that's probably more of an issue just at the manufacturing stage, but there's also some work in the literature that's shown passivation can degrade 
you know, uh, based on exposure to light and temperature. And one of the big challenges right now, at least in the case, especially for like multi perk cells, is separating when does the passivation degrade versus when does the, the actual bulk carrier lifetime degrade in, in the material itself. So things like carrier induced degradation. So some of the degradation for surface passivation is also related to hydrogen. And a lot of people have said that a lot of the carrier, carrier induced degradation is related to hydrogen in one way or the other. Um, and so that can be a difficult one to suss out, but in the literature, there are some examples of how you can do that with very careful experimentation. But again, it's, it's a challenging one to do to just kind of spot these defects um, just using like an EL image. You almost need to know the kind of the, the history of the samples in terms of like their exposure to light and temperature. Next slide. So cell metallization. So you, know, you could argue the metallization and interconnection are, you know, couple of the areas where degradation is, is especially concerning. Um, and this applies to both multi and mono, ALBSF and PERC. And so some of the different, uh, you know, defects and failure modes, you have front contact grid interruptions. This is one that, uh, you know, everyone's probably seen if you've seen EL images of these types of cells. Um, doesn't have a huge performance penalty and it doesn't really seem to have any kind of reliability risk in my opinion, but I'd, I'd be happy to to hear otherwise if that is the case. Um, there's another feature that looks similar. It, it almost looks like an interruption, but it seems to, to stem from uh, kind of a contact failure near the solder pad. So I'll show some examples of that one. And um, we're still kind of like really trying to understand that specific failure mode, but this one seems to be related to also mechanical stresses. And so this is one that we think there could be some potential risk um, there. Um, it's mostly an issue for soldered bus bar cells, um, as opposed to kind of things like, you know, smart wire or shingled interconnects, but it, it's something that we'll bring up and we're currently looking into. There's also, of course, contact corrosion. Um, this has been observed quite a bit with exposure to damp heat, with acetic acid formation when you have EVA packaging. So that's pretty well known, but we have seen different signatures of this and some of the work that we've done with, with Roger and his team, uh, where depending on the type of paste and the frit composition that you use, um, the, the signature can look quite a bit different. Um, so that, that, that's kind of interesting. And we think that could be related to the underlying kind of uh, chemical processes that are going on at the interface between the silicon and the, the frit and the silver. Um, and then you have rear contact voids that are only applicable, um, that, are, that are for perk cells, and then rear contact corrosion is, is another one. So rear contact voids aren't really that much of an issue. I think Early on, there were manufacturers were concerned about those, and we had some projects with manufacturers how to detect those. But I think people have found ways, uh, you know, using different printing methods and different paste and firing procedures to kind of avoid those rear contact voids. But I'll show an example of that too. Next slide. So front grid interruptions. A lot of you have probably seen this. Um, so here's an example where we did, um, you know, some biased PL imaging. So we have our open circuit PL imaging that we use to get uh, the J0, the saturation current density, and you, you can kind of see that this highlights kind of those grain boundaries and dislocation clusters that act as recombination centers, basically. And then when you do the bias PL, you can directly calculate the actual series resistance and get a map of that. And what you see are, are some of the rectangular dark regions showing in the efficiency map, which we also, we, we, we determine using a combination of these different PL imaging methods. Um, you can see some of those dark rectangular regions show up as bright regions in the series resistance. And essentially that's commonly just a screen printing defect. So if you have a, you know, just, just an interruption where you have like a gap in the finger, there's no path for the current to basically travel. So you have this high resistance path for it to get back to the bus bars. Uh, and so that, that's a common one. Although, you know, the, the actual impact on efficiency doesn't seem to be like massive, and it certainly doesn't seem to be like any kind of real reliability threat as far as, as far as I'm aware of. Next slide. I think that's a bit different from this one. So here you can see another example, and we see this one a lot, in, especially in, in uh, modules that have gone through some kind of mechanical stress. Um, and so if you look here, you can see similar like dark rectangles. I've kind of highlighted them in white, but they also occur in other parts of the cell. But you can see they can get quite severe as the case on the left versus a little less severe here. So what we think is happening is that where the finger goes and connects the bus bar, uh, probably due to some kind of mechanical stresses, um, you're getting a separation of that finger from the bus bar. So now you can't, now current is, is uh, 
having trouble getting all the way back to that bus bar. And so it'll often originate either near the solder pads themselves or kind of along the bus bar. And so um, we're doing quite a bit of work to kind of characterize this. And, and some, some of the work that we're trying to do with like machine learning, for example, we're trying to distinguish between those two because we think the fundamental reason is quite a bit different. In one case, it's probably a print defect. In the other case, it's, it's probably related more to kind of like the stresses that are going on within the cell once it's encapsulated and, and put in the field. Next slide. And here's some examples of the front contact corrosion. I'll try to move quickly through this. So this is one that um, my understanding is you don't see in the field much, but when you put uh, mini modules through damp heat for a long time, for a very long time, you'll start to see this. Um, and so it's where the, you have this darkening occurring, you know, from the bus bar kind of rating out away from the bus bar. So when you do PL, you don't really see it. So we can kind of attribute this to uh, a resistive loss. Um, we have done some QE mapping and we see it doesn't appear to affect current collection, which is a bit surprising. We'd like to dive a little bit more into that. So maybe there still is a current path. It's just highly resistive. So we're still looking more into that. But um, if you contrast this, if you go to the next slide, you'll see more of the kind of the common way that you would think of in, in a lot of the literature where you see this, this type of uh, contact corrosion where it occurs all over the cell. And so this one is the one that's a bit more problematic because it starts to happen earlier. Um, and this one has been, you know, studied quite a bit and it's related to that, again, that acetic acid starts to um, remove some of the lead oxide frit that's between the silver and the silicon interface. And so um, our understanding at this point is that, you know, depending on, it seems to be mostly an issue between multi and mono. And the reason for that is the, the surface morphology between the two are different. You have pyramids and isotexture in another case, and you have to use specific frit for the multi to make sure you have very good adhesion. It's hard to get as, as good adhesion there. So the, the frit that they use makes it more, a bit more um, susceptible to this form of degradation. And of course, the, the paste suppliers, is my understanding, they're very aware of this and they're working through ways to resolve that. Um, but we're, we're still trying to get a really good understanding of this versus the other mechanism. And the other mechanism we think may be related to some metal diffusion from the interconnect and then a subsequent kind of oxidation that results in like a delamination of the finger. So we're, we're, we're still trying to study that, but it's, it's kind of interesting to see these, uh, you know, these, these two completely different like signatures in the EL image that seem to be related to a similar kind of uh, corrosion process. Um, next slide. And I mentioned the, the voids in perk cells. So this is an example of a perk cell where we did some open circuit PL and, and we also did some acoustic microscopy and some cross-sectional SEMs. And so there's different types of, of voids that you can have. You can have a, obviously a good contact where you have the, um, you know, you have the aluminum contact and you can see the BSF. You have some voids where the BSF's there, but the contact's not there. So you get some passivation from the BSF, but you don't have a current path. And then you can have voids without the BSF. That's kind of the worst variety because you have a, a basically like, you know, no, no path for current, but also you don't really have a BSF providing passivation. So uh, doing combinations, you can detect this. But like I said, I don't, I don't really think this is something the industry is that concerned with. I think they've kind of addressed this issue, uh, it seems. Um, next slide. All right, now the module level, there's, a, there's of course a bunch of things that can go wrong. And I'll talk briefly about cell fracture and then interconnect failure here to wrap up. Next slide. So cell fracture, I'll give a shout out to um, uh, Hubert Senor and Eric Schneller who worked with uh, Andrew Gabor on uh, developing this load spot system where they can do simultaneous IV uh, curve measurements and EL images while modules are under mechanical loads. And so from that, that acts as a great uh, kind of database to look at examples of what things can go wrong. And so um, working with with Hubert and others, we've kind of been looking at cracks and different, and there's a bunch of ways to classify cracks and that, that's very well studied. We, for our purposes to keep it simple, uh, we just have kind of these closed cracks, which I show on the far left. Cracks where um, there does seem to be some resistive effect. You see this gradient in the EL image that suggests there is this kind of resistive um, kind of, uh, you know, current flow issue that you can see here in the middle. And then you have the cracks that we have completely isolated kind of regions where it becomes completely dark. And so, that's one way to characterize that. And so cell fracture is obviously a problem. Uh, uh, and you know, there's a lot of, that's already been brought up with glass to glass and you know, it's something that the industry is paying a lot of attention to. And then the, the last one I'll talk about, next slide, is um, 
interconnect issues. And so this is from an experiment one of my graduate students did, uh, Dylan Colvin, where he deliberately kind of uh, cut interconnects at different parts of the cell within a module. Um, so specific um, interconnects were, were deliberately disconnected. And he did a bunch of experiments uh, where he cut more of them over time. And we look at the impact on serial resistance and also the signature of EL. So this, this one is, is pretty clear and pretty obvious when you see it. So you'll see this sometimes. Uh, and then we can also, by doing EL as a function of current, we can fit uh, a curve and get serial resistance. And you can see how you can, you know, you show, shows up as a high serial resistance in these regions. So this is another one that, that, that's a pretty clear and obvious defect when you, when you start to see that one too. All right, and I think that's the last slide. Thanks. And then, yeah, questions, please please feel free to uh, post questions in the chat. Thanks, Jen. Great, thank you, Chris. So now we'll have our first Q&A session. Um, let's see, so thank you for putting questions into the chat. Um, let's start with one for uh, Bill Gamboji. So Bill, what do you think could be the cause of PID and modules using PoE as encapsulants? This is from Chiara Beretta. Yeah, it's, good. it's a good question. Uh, uh, we have seen it. Um, I think that PoE is more resistive, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not completely uh, insulating. Uh, even especially under the damp heat condition where you're where you're uh, you know you're putting moisture into the into the encapsulant and potentially changing its re, uh, resistance uh, I think from the back side uh, a lot of people are looking at uh, um, uh, impact to the passivation layer due to charged particles and uh, you know we're as we look at the difference between glass glass and glass back sheet we're suspecting that maybe the the you know some charged particles from the rear glass could be uh, could be participating. Great, thanks. Um, let's see. Here's a question for Chris Davis from April Jeffries regarding your reliability risk tables for cell fractures. The risk is high for Perkin ALBSF full and half cells. For wire and shingled interconnections, the risk is classified as low. Is this proven in the field, or is this from a logical reduction in risk based on the expected improvements from these technologies? So I can't comment as whether, like, in the actual field deployments over long amounts of time, whether, whether that's been proven. But I do know from some of the work I mentioned, uh, Hubert and Eric uh, uh, at, at FSEC, they've done on this load spot system. It does appear that there's at least experimental evidence that they are, in fact, uh, you have they're, they're more um, resilient against like cracking. So cracking can still occur, right? That's more of a function of like the mechanical structure of the module, you know, like the thickness of the glass and the frame and everything. But the thing about uh, the shingled interconnects and the, the kind of the, the wire connections is it does seem like that they're, they're when, they, when cracks do form, you have less of a penalty, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, here's the question for Kunal. Uh, what are the possible reasons for the 2.5% degradation rates in the first year? And is it common to all types of modules? Um, so this came up in what Chris was talking about too. Um, light induced degradation is the main cause of that initial uh, first year of degradation. Um, it's present in P type modules uh, more than anything else. So uh, a common way that people are trying to get around it is by using N type modules. Um, and it seems to be present a little bit more in monocrystalline um, cells as well, uh, rather than polycrystalline cells. So I think um, the mentality in the industry now is to sort of experiment with these different architectures and cell types and designs to be able to minimize this kind of degradation, um, whether it's LID or some um, variation uh, on that mechanism, depending on the type of cell, um, in order to uh, bring it down. But so far, it seems like, um, across all these different kinds of modules, we're still seeing about two to 3% in that first year. Great. Um, here's a question for Chris. From your VOC images on slide 61, it seems crystallographic orientation can play a substantial role in the multi-silicon wafer ca um, causing VOC. 
varying from 0.5 to 0.675, while the image of monosilicon wafer shows more homogeneous output. And uh, in the multi-silicon wafer, do you think those dark areas are planes with different orientations or just microstructure defects? I think most of them, in my experience, the ones that become particularly darker when you have those dislocation clusters, um, those, those seem to you know, really have a uh, VOC penalty associated with them. Um, I do know that there's, there's quite a bit of work in the literature on this already, and I'm, I'm certainly not um, a, an expert on uh, you know, the um, uh, multicrystalline defects, but it, it does seem like we also notice there's, there's certain, um, certain grains within themselves that show up darker. And so is that because the entire grain? Sorry. Sorry. Um, so is that because the entire grain is darker or is it because like the, the grain boundary, you know, because it's high angle, low angle grain boundary. So you can find a lot in the literature on this, but what I, our, we've definitely observed is that the, the dislocation clusters themselves seem to be the ones that really always just show up dark. And, and those kind of cells that have less of those, they tend to have the higher VOC and uh, the, the, the PL image seems a bit more homogeneous, obviously not as homogeneous as a, as a uh, like a CZ wafer though. Okay, great. Um, Bill, have you tested the effects of water spray on the reliability of Tedlar performance, especially when spray is applied at elevated temperatures and combined with UV or light? Oh, uh, you're, I, I assume we're talking about water spray from the backside of the bifacial module. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Um, so, so no, um, we haven't. We have done, we have done uh, typical weathering type uh, exposures using water spray and um, and UV in a xenon chamber, a, a typical weatherometer type exposure. We have not seen changes in significant changes in the color or mechanical properties. We've done that mostly on on back sheets and films. I don't believe we have done that on bifacial modules. Okay, um, so I think we'll get started with the second half of the sessions. Um, thanks everybody for entering your questions, and maybe we'll get to some more of those at the end of the um, second session. And our next speaker is Dr. Jennifer Carter, who will discuss PV cell fracture probability and foreloading of PV modules. Jennifer is an associate professor of material science and engineering. She received her PhD from The Ohio State University, and she specializes in the experimental design for elucidating damage for mechanism in materials under thermal mechanical loading conditions. She has two kids and has been riding motorcycles since she was seven years old. Take it away, Jennifer. Might as well start with something fun. Thanks, uh, Jim Braid. So I'm gonna present today, uh, most of the work I'm gonna present has actually been done by uh, Nick Bosco at, at NREL. Um, so hopefully if uh, there are any questions I cannot answer, I can phone a friend because he is on the line. Uh, next. So, the goal in the program was to try to uh, elucidate degradation mechanisms in the polymeric materials, the seal of the encapsulants, and so on and so forth in the modules. Um, and one of the ways that we wanted to do this was under mechanical load. And so we went with a simple loading configuration. Might as well keep it simple. And so we went with four point bending uh, analysis. And this is really nice because we can do under load and displacement and see cracking events. Um, and we can also take the uh, derivative of that slope and get changes in control. And so what happens here uh, is that we take the load and displacement of each of those cracking events, uh, next slide. And for each uh, experiment, well, it looks Right, each experiment um, ends up with a probability of, uh, we run uh, cracking experiments and we meaning uh, Nick Bosco did uh, on 30 or so um, either silicon cells or modules to get a viable distribution of the probability of failure. And the goal with the T50 program was to try to understand how exposure lifetimes degraded the 
performance of these things uh, over time. And so the first step in the project, uh, next slide, was to determine, well, what is the loading that we should do uh, experiment? Uh, because, of course, we don't want them to fail to begin with, uh, but we want them to potentially fail because we want to see degradation mechanisms. So at the beginning of this program, we didn't have our nice, beautiful uh, four uh, cell mini module. And of course, you would not want to run failure probability cells to just break them. And so Nick, uh, a series of uh, experiments, next slide, where we, he ran tests to get probabilities of failure of single cells and the effects of different processing um, conditions. So he ran experiments on bare tests and then under each of the different processing conditions. Um, he tested the mechanical, of course, the capsulant types that we have. And the goal was to use finite element analysis to do a geometric conversion from uh, single cell mini modules in a small scale um, four point bend system with only a 18 millimeter uh, span to conversion to the 36 inch span that we would need uh, for the four point modules. And so under all of these loading conditions, next slide please, uh, work. So he started with bare cells, um, both parallel and perpendicular, and he sees that there is a uh, difference in properties with uh, orientation, so processing condition or texture analysis. And then, of course, as we sought, add solder to these things, we see a shift from the red curves uh, to the black curves uh, with the addition of, of the soldering step. Slide. Of course, they see a similar change uh, with the bifacial shells. Um, as indicated by one of the little blue uh, curves that's now hard to see, but that is what it is. But we see a similar orientation dependence and a similar soldering dependency. Okay, and so when we moved from single cells to modules, the orientation dependency continues to um, show up. Um, and in this case, we, they were all soldered cells um, and we did cells with their EVA or uh, PLE. We find in the, that the um, properties of the EVA and the POA, POE modules are very similar because of course the encapsulants have similar stiffnesses at room temperature. So in the conclusions that he found from over 120 fracture experiments, just to get these curves, um, is that the bifacial cells are more sensitive. And if we are going to uh, come up with a design, we need to account for the orientation dependency uh, that persists as we build modules. So next slide. From there, he took these, the input parameters from those 120 experiments. We got the Weibull modulus probability of failure parameters. Uh, he inputted the geometry um, and fit the elastic properties of the different materials into a finite element model. So he started with the um, single cell mini module and fit parameters um, and geometry to the mechanical performance that we saw uh, from the experiments. And from that, he scaled up the finite element model to account for the four cell mini module um, below. And we get an output of the displacement as a function of applied load and a conversion or M term in the Weibull modulus parameter equation shown below. And so from that work, uh, we end up with the set of experiments, the starting point that we need uh, for the T50 program. So here we decided that we would test uh, the four cell mini modules under four point bend to uh, different proof loads, which had a prediction of 5% failure for the as received or un, 
uh, exposed samples. And we predicted that if we saw a 10% difference in the encapsulants in the polymeric materials, that we would end up with uh, either break 14% uh, or 35% failure rate, depending on uh, orientation for those things. And so from there, we applied that uh, proof load. Uh, and we do this in this uh, experimental setup where we have, we take the, by we, I mean the graduate students uh, take tau psi EL images before foie print bending under high res conditions. So this is in a dark box, uh, nice alignment, so on and so forth. And then we move this to the four point picture uh, in the basement and we run uh, EL images before loading under peak load and after. And these are done in the lab under ambient light conditions. Uh, and you can see those are up at the top. You see we have a keystoning effect because of the geometry constraints, um, but we're able to see uh, cracks opening uh, in the middle of the loading sequence um, of what's going on, measure of what's happening in the cell. Next slide. And so we can, we saw under the first set of mini modules that we um, analyzed, uh, we see two different types of behavior. We either see cells that are uncracked, in which case there's no change in the EL image uh, as a function of um, how the numbers indicate uh, exposure steps. So after step one, two, three, and four. Um, and so those are two, three. Um, and so we don't see any cracking. Um, they didn't have any cracking beforehand and we see very little change uh, in the compliance value. So if we took the slope of the load displacement curve, that's what we're, we're comparing for uh, compliance values. In the secondary case, next slide. Uh, we can see that we have one system in which we did see crack, cracks open uh, as at the top of the loading, but you can see from the uh, load displacement data that we see none of those offsets like I showed on the very first where we see the crack event during the mechanical testing. And so what that tells me, the combination of the EL image and the compliance value is that those cracks existed prior to mechanical testing. They are not there because of the mechanical testing. So that's the equivalent of a crack existing and just opening and closing, load and unload. And we see that, that there is some degradation and some change uh, in the amount of crack. Um, due to exposure, but uh, these cracks existed because of manufacturing defects at the beginning of uh, the setup. And so we see very, again, we don't see cracks during the load displacement experiments. We don't see that jump in offset. And so those cracks existed um, beforehand. So next slide. So if we take the derivative of the load uh, displacement curve, we can plot the compliance as a function of uh, exposure time. And so we did uh, four exposures of heat and oh, I've forgotten what the FSL slides in front of me, so I apologize. Um, someone can throw me a lifeline if needed. Roger, can you? Mm -hmm. FSL standpoint for again? Full spectrum light. This is the light exposure. Thank you. I can obviously tell I did not set up the exposure steps. Um, but we could see that for all of the mini modules that are uncracked, we do see an increase of compliance uh, as a function of exposure, which tells me that the polymer are evolving uh, and degrading with uh, the exposure. But of course, the Compliance increase is very small at this, at this point. Mm -hmm. You see that the cracked mini modules, 
we see a difference in property. We first see this initial drop uh, in compliance as, as we begin to get uh, cracking and degradation. So you can, um, very small changes in compliance to discern different types of failure mechanisms. Uh, and we will continue to do this uh, as we move forward through the T50 program and uh, expose all the other samples. I believe that is the end of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And next we'll hear about non-destructive mechanical property changes of packaging materials from Samira Nalan Venkat. Samira is a graduate student in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at Case Western. She joined the SDLA Research Center just in August 2019, and her work in the Toward 50 Year Lifetime PV Modules projects includes mini module fabrication, mechanical studies of mini modules using four point proof loading, micro indentation of PV module packaging coupons, and degradation pathways using network structural equation modeling. Samira? Hi, uh, so today I'll be talking about micro indentation studies and some of the results obtained from the PERG degradation project by Dr. Mohan Wong. The study and the method will be continued to be used in the T50 project in the near future as well. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, microindentation is a non-destructive mechanical method to study the properties of multi-layer polymeric systems, such as coupons, which have a front glass, encapsulant, and back sheet layers. So the microindentation experiment in this study is done from the back sheet end, and there are two important quantities that are measured. One is the reduced modulus E star, which takes into account the elastic deformation in sample as well as the tip, and creep, which is uh, the tendency of a polymer to deform under load and is a measure of viscoplasticity. And uh, what you see on the left is the deformation magnitude of two and three layered uh, models from FEM simulations done by Dr. Mohawong. And it is important to understand the properties of uh, encapsulant uh, variation during exposures because an increase in the encapsulant modulus leads to an increase in the cell cracking event or probability of failure, whereas a decrease in the encapsulant modulus would risk in creep. Next slide, please. So uh, coming to the experimental section, there, are, uh, there were 12 coupons that were exposed under continuous UV or QUV exposure using different packaging combinations. There were two encapsulants used, EVA and PUE, and three uh, multi-layered pack sheets, KPX, KPF, and PPF. And you can see the structures uh, in the diagram below. And the microindentation micro apparatus has the capacity to do two types of experiments. One is the multi-depth indentation, which consists of multiple loading and unloading steps. And creep, which has only a single loading and unloading step. And then it is held at a constant load for a couple of seconds to achieve steady state creep. Next slide, please. So multi-depth indentation method consists of multiple unloading at six different depths. So E star is depth dependent rather than load dependent. So these experiments are load controlled and the depth varies. So if there is an increase in depth, it means there is a decrease in the reduced modulus and it means that the material is more flexible or compliant. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this is the first result from multi-depth indentation. So there are, uh, several exposure steps and for after the end of each exposure step, the reduced modulus is calculated from the microindentation data. And what you can see here is at the end of the exposure step of 2,500 hours, there is some change in the E star value, but we would have to do further experimentation to uh, come up with more definitive answers. But uh, as you can see, there is a significant difference between different material types uh, from these six combinations. So if we keep the back sheet constant, uh, it is observed that E star of EVA based coupons have higher values compared with those with PUE uh, encapsulant. 
the next slide please and also an experimental model was developed to predict e star using generalized linear model so this was done at three different depths 5 10 and 15 micrometers and uh, delta e star uh, divided by dose was calculated for different packaging uh, combinations so it is observed that the coupons in which ppf is the back sheet has a higher uh, delta e star by dose value and that is because of a higher oxygen transmission rate and also it is uh, evident that there is a slightly positive slope in the case of eva ppf and poe ppf coupons and also that poe shows uh, hardening which corresponds to a lower e star at the end of the exposure cycle next slide please so coming to the creep trend in coupons uh, first is uh, what is on the y axis it is the normalized creep depth in percent which is simply the ratio of creep depth and the back sheet thickness so if you keep the back sheet constant and just look at the trends in uh, encapsulants there is some kind of difference there is some kind of creep change due to the encapsulant if the back sheet is kept constant even though the indentation is done from the back sheet end and also it is observed that poe kpf and eva ppf have the least baseline creep depth but this trend is more pronounced in the case of eva kpx and poe kpx the change in creep depth due to increasing exposure next slide please yeah so these are the two cases in which the trend is very much evident and uh, the Uh, increase is due to the presence of thermoplastic polyolefin in kpx back sheet so during continuous uv exposure ppo undergoes change session there is some change in molecular properties and hence it leads to a creep increase and this is confirmed by ftir results as well uh, next slide please so the future plan uh, with respect to the t50 project using micro indentation is to continue exposure of coupons to about 5000 hours till now only 2500 or 500 hour exposure has been done for coupons and we plan to continue it in the qv chamber and do multi depth indentation and creep experiments as before and we intend to extend this procedure of testing coupons to testing mini modules and see how they would compare with the coupon results that we currently have um that's it from my side thank Great. you thank you samira our next speaker is gigi lu who will present results from both accelerated and field exposures of double glass and glass back sheet modules in the towards 50 year life time pv modules project Chichi is a third year PhD student in the SDLE Research Center under the Toward 50 project and her current research is focused on the study of photovoltaic module degradation by performance modeling, image processing and time series analysis of multiple characterization techniques. Chichi? Thanks Jennifer. Uh next step please. Uh, our T50 project uh, has uh, both indoor accelerated and outdoor exposure. Today, we would like to show the progress in both. Start with set one indoor accelerated exposure categorization results. Next page. Yeah, uh, the result I'm going to present today covers the T50 set one mo mini modules fabricated by CSI. The cells used are monofacial multi-silicon perc cells. Here is a, a figure of the research mini module. We have four cells in each module and they are connected in series. And we have two type of encapsulant, EVA versus PoE, and two kinds of module architecture, glass back sheet uh, versus double glass. So set one modules in total have four types of different kinds of modules. And for each type, we have two modules under each kind of indoor accelerated exposure. Uh, there are in total two kinds of indoor accelerated exposure. The first one is modified dump heat. Compared to the standard dump heat, we reduce the uh, temperature to 80 Celsius. And the second uh, indoor accelerated exposure is modified dump heat plus full spectrum light. Uh, at every step, one third of its exposure time is under full spectrum light. 
and our research mini module are preconditioned before we start the uh, accelerated explorers. Next slide. Yeah, at each step, we measure the multiple ingredients IV curve for both modules and the cell, and sensible C curve for each cell, three current level EL images and PL image for each module. And uh, uh, then we extracted features from this measurement and observing how these features change over time can give us information on the degradation behavior of the module. Right now for the IV curve, we follow the IEC standard to extract the series resistance from the multiple ingredients IV curve and then use a DDIV algorithm, which is an R package available on Quran released by us to extract other IV features from the one sun IV curve. Uh, for the sensibility curve, which is the right line you can see on the figure, we can obtain another curve called pseudo IV curve, another curve called effective lifetime versus minority carry density under log 10 scale. And right now for the pseudo IV curve, we extracted five features from it. And for the effective lifetime curve, we extracted four features from it. These four features correspond to the coordinates of two special points. One is a peak, another one corresponding to the VMP, and for the EL image, uh, three current level EL image, we first will apply a image processing pipeline to get the module image from the cell image. And then we extracted the mean and median intensity and normalized bar rates from the EL image. Uh, Georgia, can you click uh, the button? Yeah. And uh, uh, the normalized bus bar width is equal to the average bus bar width divided by the image dimension. So it's a value from zero to one. Unless your module experiences very severe bus bar corrosion, this number usually is very small, close to zero. And for the PL image, first we still process the uh, uh, image to be cell image, and then we extract the median and the mean intensity. Next step, we're gonna observing how this IV feature changing over time and uh, do the modeling and get the rate of change to do comparison across different types of modules. Next slide. Yeah, the so left figure show how one feature is changing over time for the four types of modules we have. Each color is for one cell and for the points belong to the same cell across in different explorer time, we connected them by a line. The black line you see on the figure is a smooth average. And in order to compare the rate of change of this feature across the four types of modules we have, we fit linear model to each cell and then extract the slope and calculate the average and confidence interval to do comparison across different types of module. The confidence interval here we choose is 83.4%. The reason for that is because we uh, over focus on this result is do comparison across different types of modules. And the CI uh, confidence interval is not commonly used to, to do the uh, sample mean test. And that is the job for the t-test. However, if you uh, have enough samples in each group, uh, the sample size is uh, about or larger than 10, and the standard error is within the factor of two, then you can choose to use this uh, confidence interval to visualize the t-test result with p-value close to 0.05. And right now for the uh, type that does not meet that requirement, we will mark a star uh, beside the error bar. And right now the feature we are looking at is the max power is rated from the IV curve and we are fo focusing on the modified dump heat is forward first. From this result, you can see the average value uh, did not show significant difference uh, across each other. However, the confidence interval also present a distribution of this result which you can see glass backsheet modules has more decrease uh, compared to double glass. And then we check more features and try to find the reason contributing to their power loss. Next slide. Since we are doing modified dump heat, this is polar condition. Usually well accelerated corrosion problem happens to the module. So the first feature we check is the series resistant. However, the result shows that uh, their average value has no significant difference. And uh, uh, considering the confidence interval, uh, it shows that POE has more uh, RS increase uh, compared to EVA. So this RS uh, shows totally different uh, module type dependency uh, compared to max power. Next slide. Another feature is closely related with coral problem is the normalized bus bar base. And from this result, we see double glass modules do not experience bus bar corrosion but glass backsheet modules do, 
more apparent in the glass back sheet plus EVA type. And this result means the corrosion problem is uh, very located to the uh, phosphor region for the glass back sheet plus EVA type. Next slide. And uh, now we move our focus to this max power extracted from the pseudo IV curve. You can treat this max power as the one without the influence of series resistance. From this result, we can see after we remove the uh, RS influence, double glass modules has no sign of power drop, which indicates that corrosion problem is a major problem of the double glass modules power loss in uh, the modified dump heat. And compare this result with what we get from the max power extracted from the IV curve, the position uh, for glass back sheet plus EVA, it does not have any change, which indicates corrosion problem does not contribute uh, much power loss for this type. However, for glass back sheet plus PoE, you can see this number, it reduced from uh, negative 0.4 to about negative 0.1, which indicates that uh, about 75% of power loss for glass back sheet PoE is contributing by corrosion. Next, we're gonna uh, check more features and try to explain the power loss in glass back sheet plus EVA and the remaining 25% uh, of power loss in glass back sheet plus PoE. The first feature we check is the uh, IC short circuit current. And we found that uh, compared to double glass modules, glass back sheet modules has more apparent IC decrease, especially in the glass back sheet plus EVA. And we believe this is uh, one important reason uh, contributing to its power loss. Next slide. And the next feature we check is the shunting resistant. Shunting resistance is very difficult to extract it accurately because of very flat IC region. However, from this figure, you can see a, a very apparent difference in trend for the shunting resistance in different types of module. More apparent for the glass back sheet PoE, it has a very significant decrease of shunting resistance. And we think this is like a, the major reason contributing to its remaining 25% power loss. Next slide. In addition, uh, we found that uh, a lot of uh, features is rated from the Sunsville C curve uh, has decreasing trend for all types of modules. This indicates that like, all type of our modules experience some degree of uh, recombination problem. Here I choose to show the uh, result of the effective lifetime corresponding to the VMT point. And you can see uh, the average value did not show significant difference. However, the CI is uh, lower for glass back sheet plus EVA compared to others, which um, maybe the recombination problem is another contributing factor to this type of uh, the power loss of this type of modules. Next slide. Here we summary our funding for mini modules under modified dump heat. Even we found the average value of the rate in max power obtained from the IV curve did not have significant difference across different type of modules, but the reason contributing to its power loss is quite different. For the double glass module, the major problem is corrosion. And for glass back sheet plus EVA, uh, the major problem is IIC decrease, and it probably has uh, more recombination ICO compared to others. And for glass back sheet PoE, uh, plus PoE, the major problem is corrosion, but it also has contribution from the shunting decrease. Next slide. Now we move to another authority uh, explorer we have, uh, modified dump heat plus full spectrum light. This explorer compared to modified dump heat, uh, at each step, one third of its explorer time is under full spectrum light. And uh, first though, we look at the max power is rated from the IV curve. The result shows the average value has no significant difference. Uh, however, the CF for glass back sheet plus PoE is lower than other types. Next slide. Now we go through the same process to try to find the reasons contributing to this power loss. And uh, the findings are very similar with what we find in modified dump heat, but we have more confidence that the glass back sheet plus EVA has more severe recombination problem compared to other type. Because right now, if you look at the effective lifetime corresponding to the VMP point, uh, that confidence interval is no longer show overlapping with others. And we also found that glass back sheet plus EVA has slightly shunting decrease. 
this result agrees with our understanding of the exposure conditions. Our full spectrum light, the average light intensity is about 420 watt per meter square, and uh, it contains very limited UV, and this exposure condition accelerated recombination uh, as a current source inside of uh, accelerated aging of the encapsulant, which will usually present as an IAC decrease. Next slide. That's all fundings we have for uh, the indoor acerity explorers for now. And here is some of our future plan. We are currently working on to improve the stability of our IV environment. Uh, and uh, we want to study more of our PL image about the defects spatial distribution. And we would like to dig to uh, more about the IC decrease and shunting increase, shunting decrease of the two types of gas backsheet modules we have. And right now we are about to start the site two indoor acerity exposure very soon. As site two modules have bifacial multisilicon perk cells and the backside encapsulant is uh, uh, opaque type. And by comparing the site one and site two results, it's gonna help us to locate the degradation behavior dependency more clear. Next slide. That's all we have for the indoor part. Now we move to the progress we have in outdoor exposure. Next slide, please. In total, we have 32 outdoor mini modules. They are all fabricated by CSI. And these 32 modules belong to 16 tabs. So uh, for each tab, we have two mini modules. And these 16 tabs covers modules with monofacial versus bifacial cell, encapsulant of EVA versus PoE. And for the backside encapsulant, we have more cans. Uh, it could be UV cutoff, opaque, or transparent. And we have double glass and glass backsheet modules. And we also have two different types of modules, monofacial module versus bifacial module. Monofacial modules is the site one to site three, and bifacial modules is site four. For the glass back sheet bifacial modules, we have the back uh, side encapsulant is the UV cutoff type, and the uh, uh, back sheet is the uh, uh, clear back sheet supplied by DuPont. Next slide. <laughs> These 32 modules are installed on a fixed track on our sun farm. And uh, right now we use the uh, Daystar control unit and the load unit to recording the one minute max power and GHI and 10 minutes IV curve. And uh, we use a Campbell sun data logger to recording the one minute POA and the module temperature of these 32 modules. The so exposure start on April 28th. So right now we have a uh, time series data about three months. This short time series is just too short for construct degradation study. But what we can do is do an initial power output, uh, power output comparison since we have so many types of modules. And our POA sensor got installed one month late compared to the start of the exposure. So right now we use the GHI as the irradiance data source for further data analyzing. Next slide, please. What we see right now is the uh, uh, module temperature distribution and the irradiance distribution of both GHI and POA. The median module temperature is about 40 Celsius and the median irradiance is about 700 Watt per meter square. Next slide. Now we apply a method called XBX plus UTC to our time series max power to get daily predict max power at reference conditions. This method, UTC, represents universal temperature correction. And uh, it, this method first uh, do a uh, low irradiance uh, filtering, and then get the temperature coefficients by fit the linear model of max power versus module temperature using the data range very close to the reference irradiance range. And then it do a temperature correction to all the max power uh, using the temperature coefficients uh, it obtained from the last step. And then for uh, each day, it fit a model of the temperature corrected max power versus the irradiance. And finally, it inputs a, a reference irradiance into the model of each day to get the daily predict max power. And for each module, we have data about 90 days predict max power. And this data can be used to form a distribution. Here I show an example of one module. Next step, we're gonna compare this distribution across different variation we have in modules. Next step, please. The first comparison we do is modules with bifacial cells versus modules with monofacial cells. The results show their average value has a significant difference. Uh, the one with bifacial modules has higher power output, 
the difference is about three, uh, 4.3% in power. Next slide. Next comparison we do is uh, the modules with EVA in capsent versus the modules with PoE in capsent. The average value shows a significant difference and the uh, modules with EVA in capsent has higher power output and the difference is about 2.6% in power. Next slide. Uh, now we are looking at the comparison across uh, module architecture, glass back sheet modules versus double glass modules. These two, the average value does not have significant difference. Glass back sheets, the average value is slightly higher, but the difference is within 1%. Next slide. The last comparison we do is bifacial module versus monofacial module. And the result shows the average value has a significant difference. The bifacial module has higher power outputs. The difference is about 2.6%. And just for curious that whether uh, the uh, bifacial glass back sheet module can have similar initial power output compared to double glass module, we take all the four types of bifacial modules we have and plot the CI here. And from this result, we can see for EVA uh, type of uh, glass back sheet bifacial module, it has a similar power output compared to double glass module, but it's slightly lower in the PoE uh, glass back sheet modules. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's all our current results. Uh, here is some of our future plans. We definitely gonna continue our other explorer throughout the whole project period or even longer. Once we got the time series data slightly longer than one year, we will start to do regression method and uh, uh, study the degradation behavior of it. And also involve the time series IV curve since it can give us the change in the IV features for located the degradation mechanisms. And recently we have a good package came out for all our uh, IV curves analyzing. It can, uh, that uh, package is called SensibleC and it can be used to construct the ICVC curve and do loss factor calculation to compare the change in the IV features to the power basis. And once we got the indoor model and outdoor model, this project also contains a part to do indoor outdoor cross correlation. That's all we have for T50 results right now. Great, thank you, Jishi. And again, please okay. enter any questions in the chat for the second Q&A session, which will be after this last talk. Our final speaker is Greg Horner of Tau Science, who will present instrumentation and tool PV research. He did his PhD research on 3.5 materials characterization and has spent time in both the semiconductor and solar industries developing machines for process control. He started Tau Science in 2008 to focus on PV test and measurement, and the team has worked on a variety of applications spanning silicon, 3.5s, and thin films. Take it away, Greg. Okay, thank you, Jen. Okay, I think we can jump right to the next slide. Um, this presentation is more of a list. It's not a coherent um, study of any particular uh, failure mode, uh, but we're just presenting the, a list of machines that we have developed uh, in conjunction with others or on our own over the past 12 years. And it's just so that the community knows that we exist and these products exist and you might contact us in the future if you do have a new project that requires something like this. So in general, we first develop a product for R&D labs, and then if there's a need, then they may be boiled down to a simpler, faster machine that can be used in the factories. And we just kind of do this again and again, and every once in a while, something is adopted for inline metrology. Okay, next slide. For R&D, uh, the machines often are about the size of a standard US refrigerator. Um, and it's a manually loaded machine. Um, the laser enclosure, if it uses lasers, is all integrated into the box, as are all of the electronics. Um, the different techniques that we have incorporated uh, include um, Pulse QE, which is an LED-based QE system. It's very fast. You can acquire the whole EQE and reflectance spectra in about two seconds. And that's fast enough that you can mount a stage in there and you can actually map the EQE and reflectance spectra. Uh, so that's some of the work that you saw from the Davis group in Florida. IRIS is an infrared inspection system. It uses long wave infrared cameras <clears throat> to detect hotspots. If it's a cell, then the test only takes about 300 milliseconds because they heat up so quickly. 
Uh, if it's a module, it may take 30 seconds because of that high thermal mass uh, of the glass. Um, but it's possible to do it on either cells or modules. Pixel is a PL and EL imaging system, and it's also got a kind of a math capability built in so that you can take your stack of images and do math and extract uh, parameters from them. In the lower right is a new one, and that's the time resolve photoluminescence system. Um, so that takes a series of high speed PL images after a laser pulse. And so we can actually, for every pixel in the image, uh, plot out the PL intensity versus time as it decays away. Um, so uh, that's a new one. We've only shipped one machine and we'll, we'll start kind of rolling that out in the next uh, month or two. Uh, so that's a way to study not just the lifetime of a cell at a single point, but you can actually get the entire image of the lifetime. Okay, next slide. Uh, great. So sometimes uh, we boil the technique down to a desktop. Uh, it may be to lower the cost and make it more uh, accessible to you know universities and smaller budgets. Uh, and sometimes it's for the purpose of putting it in line. So this is one example. Um, this is a pulse QE system. It's using LEDs, just like the one we described in the previous screen, but we're not focusing them down to a, to a spot. We're actually illuminating the whole cell. Um, so you can go up to a 210 by 210 cell. Um, there also is a non-contact version of it where we do what we call ELE. So it's electroluminescence, but it's, it's a spectroscopy uh, used by varying the incident wavelength and monitoring the electroluminescence signal. So if we hit the next button, I think we can play this uh, next one. It kind of should pop up a movie. And if you hover over it, I think we can find the, the go button for the movie. Um, we'll see if this works. Well, maybe not. That's okay. Uh, yeah, we'll skip that then. That's no problem. Um, so the other thing that we do is um, we have R&D components. So uh, for instance, for the Case Western group, um, they needed a variety of components to finish um, their uh, coupon tester or their mini module tester. So we build LED light towers. These are liquid cooled LEDs for high brightness. Uh, the DC control systems to either apply cell bias or light bias, uh, temperature controlled chucks. Um, and the thing that ties it all together though is the, uh, the pixel control software. So if you hit the arrow one or two times, I think you'll see a few more pictures appear on this slide. So there's an example of a chuck that we would design mm -hmm. for um, on any number of bus bars. And then now the pixel software starts to appear. So this is an image um, from our GUI and one more click. We'll bring a couple more images in the lower left. Okay, and this is the really unique thing is the ability of the customer to do post-processing. So they may write a recipe to acquire, you know, 12 different images in one swoop. And it's a variety of, um, could be filters in front of the camera, uh, EL currents, uh, you know, currents driven through the cell as well as illumination conditions using the lasers or LEDs. Uh, and then they're free to write their own algorithms in any language, post-process that stack of images, and then hand the results back to the database. So in this case, it's a very clear, clearly they're just looking for cracks, they count the cracks, and hand back a processed image at the end of it. But you can do anything, all of the biased PL techniques are accessible uh, through your own code. <clears throat> okay, next slide. Okay. Uh, as we scale up, when we talk about working on modules and mini modules, the machines naturally get bigger. Uh, so here's a, a picture of a mini module scanner that we built. This is actually a QE system, and the, there's an overhead gantry that moves, moves the QE head around over the mini module. Um, I think if you hit the arrow one more time, we might see one more example. Uh, so this is inside an even larger system where you can load an entire, you know, 2.2 by 1.1 meter module. Um, this one's out at NREL now. Um, so this is a way to measure QE at any point on any cell in a module, or you can map the whole module. Uh, so that's an example of QE measurements on modules. Uh, we do a few more techniques though for 
both modules and mini modules. So we'll go to the next slide and see some of those. Okay, this was done by Steve Johnston recently uh, out at NREL. Um, so this is called uh, nickel sometimes, non-contact EL. Um, it's using a really neat uh, feature that we're illuminating one portion of the cell. And if you looked with a camera in that region, you would detect what you would call a normal PL image. But instead of doing that, we are looking for emission from non-illuminated regions of the cell. So we hit it with light in one half of the cell and we collect the EL from the other half of the cell. And then we flip, we illuminate, uh, we, we flip the illumination and the collection and then we stitch the two halves of the image together and you've got an EL image without ever touching the module or driving current through it. So actually, if you look at that picture, you can see the two leads to the module are just kind of hanging out the top of the module. There is no power supply connected. <clears throat> this scanning system moves the box around in front of each cell. It takes about four minutes to scan the entire module. Uh, the data collection is really fast, about 30 milliseconds uh, to collect one image. Um, but it has to move to the next cell. Um, we use in-gas cameras. Um, they don't have terribly high resolution, but when you do it on a cell basis, that results in a 16 megapixel image for the module. Um, it's useful both indoors and outdoors. And when you are working indoors or at dusk, there's one really strong uh, advantage to this technique. Um, that is that when you look at a normal module EL image, there's a strong background component. There's a background glow that you just can't get rid of. And that's all the surrounding cells. They're all emitting EL. The light bounces or light pipes through the glass and gets into the neighboring cells. So it's just impossible to remove that from your EL module images. When you do this technique, um, then you're really only driving one cell at a time. They're, the neighboring cells do not push out a background uh, glow. So you get really high contrast EL images. So the software will stack up anything up to a 32-bit image um, by taking multiple frames and stacking them. Um, so the next slide. Uh, so the dynamic range of the images is really what's exceptional in, in the technique. Um, and if you hit the arrow one more time, I think we'll just zoom in a little. Um, so the images are quite high quality and the dynamic range is much better than a conventional EL. Um, okay, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, the next thing we need is a good GUI so that you can do something with this information. So whether you take your image using a conventional EL or the non-contact EL, um, we have uh, recently rolled out um, a software control program that allows you to classify the defects. So this was working with Brightspot Automation, Andrew Gabor, and Will Hobbs at Southern Company, and the group at PVEL. We kind of came to a conclusion of what it should contain. Um, so it's uh, the, the EL image appears on screen, no matter how it was collected. The operator is free to tap on any cell that looks suspicious. They get a zoomed in view, a detailed view, and then they can classify the defects using the touch screen, be it a single crack or a dark cell or anything in the list. So that's, that's the list that was generated by Will Hobbs. Um, let's go to the next um, screen. So <clears throat> if the operator does this, uh, what's happening is the modules are getting graded on the fly. So if it has a certain number of single cracks or a certain number of double crack cells, those count against a total score. And eventually, according to the pre prescribed criteria, that module is a failed module. So we, we have a way of screening out modules even before they're put up on the rack. So this would be a pre-installation screening application. But you can use the data for however you wish. You could track a single module over time and come back to the database again and again to see how it has evolved over time. Um, and we have reporting systems that can summarize uh, the results. If you've measured tens or hundreds or thousands of modules, you just push the button and it'll generate a, a large report containing all the thumbnail images as well as the summary data. Okay, next slide. All right, I think we'll skip this one in the, in the name of uh, time. There is another technique called EL sweep. It's a neat way to extract cell parameters 
out of a module. So feel free to contact us if you'd like to discuss that. Uh, it's really been driven by the UCF group. Uh, I think Dylan Colvin has the most recent paper on that, um, the Davis group, uh, as well as Brightspot Automation. Okay, next uh, slide. All right, so the last one is what's currently happening and that's daytime EL. Uh, so we finally found a combination that allows us to use a silicon camera at high noon outdoors uh, doing EL. This was possible before with in-gas cameras and things like modulation or synchronous modulation, but I think we finally got it working for um, high resolution silicon cameras. It's still challenging, so it really only works on monosilicon high efficiency modules. If you bring a five-year-old poly module, uh, it probably does not have the luminous efficiency for us to extract the signal from the background of the sun. Um, and you can see even in these images that it's a grainier looking image than what we were looking at earlier. So it's still a challenging technique, but we are doing beta testing now, so feel free to contact us um, if, if there's interest there. <clears throat> Okay, I think I think that was it. Uh, feel free to contact us at Tau Science if you have any questions. Great, thank you, Greg. And we'll just do a couple of, uh, questions for the second session. I know we're at ten o'clock now, so um, let's just jump into those questions. Um, here's a question for Samira. It's, uh, it says, "Usually, microindentation creates a plastic deformed zone, deemed as a destructive method. But you mentioned your method is non-destructive. So, how did you do it? And how could you could you please elaborate on um, zigzag strain stress curve? And how did you extract the modulus from that curve?" Hi. Uh, so, those are a set of great questions. Uh, so, I'll answer one by one. So this is a non-destructive method because we don't use a very high load for, sorry, she, I mean, it, this study was not done by me. It was done by Dr. Mohamon. So she used a single depth indentation to study um, at which load uh, there would be plastic deformation and at which load there wouldn't be plastic deformation. So she found out that at 10 newtons there would be uh, plastic deformation, but somewhere around one or two newtons, there wouldn't be any type of deformation. So that way, this method is non-destructive. And uh, from the, it is not exactly a stress strain curve that I showed uh, in the slide, but it is a, a load versus uh, depth curve. So it is just to highlight that there are multiple loading and unloading steps. So we don't use, we don't extract any information from that curve. It's just to highlight that it is a multi-depth indentation. And the stand, so this method is still under development. Like she has developed the method, but we still hope to make some modifications. So there's no standard as such to perform this test yet, at least from industry point also, but Dr. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Carter can explain in further details about the analysis part and how she modified the Oliver Farr method to calculate E star for microindentation. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, I don't know that I need to weigh in it on it now, but. Uh... Yeah, so the, the Oliver Farr method was developed for extracting elastic modulus and strength behavior from nano indentation experiments to effectively get pseudo single crystal behavior um, from these samples. If you notice in Samira's slide, the zigzag pattern is load time. Placement data has a zigzag, but they come completely overlap one another, which tells you that the test is still in the elastic regime. You're getting no cracking or plasticity in the case. Um, if you want, I can share with you the um, original Oliver Farr method and uh, used for a black application of nickel alloys. So Mahong's trying to use um, this for a composite structure, which is why we have E star, and it's not the elastic properties of any one material, but the whole stack together. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, if the person who asked that question wants to reach out to Jennifer for more information on that, 
she would be happy to share that with you. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions for GT. Uh, the first one is, what is the reason for the ISC increase in the double glass modules after damp heat testing? And that's from Paula sanchez Freira. Uh, thank you. Uh, Roger, can we go to that slide? I think it's uh, slide number 117. Mm -hmm. 117? Yep. Yes. Uh, so from this one, you can see the uh, IC increase for double glass module is mostly due to the equipment system shift from step zero to step one for double glass module. After step one, the uh, trend in double glass module for IC is very stable. It's almost a flat line. And right now we are working on improve the protocol for our IV measurement. Hopefully for the site two, we're going to have more stable results for the, all the IV features we have in, uh, from the IV curve. Okay, and mm -hmm. another question for Gigi is, for outdoor exposures, you showed that modules with EVA had higher PMP compared to POE. What do you hypothesize is the reason for this? That's from April Jeffries. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, first, we know our modules, uh, all the outdoor mini modules use the same batch of cell and uh, consider the influence of encapsulation to cell as for its initial performance. I think it's most likely due to some slightly different in the encapsulation transmission, which will influence the IC directly. But right now, uh, we don't have the result came out from the IV features. But you can see our data acquisition includes a 10 minutes IV curve. So once the result came out, we can easily confirm that why, uh, which feature caused that difference and uh, uh, link that with the encapsulation property. OK, great. So I think now we'll close the session. Thank you again to all of our speakers and to everyone for your participation in today's webinar. Uh, we'll make the slides and the recording of the event publicly available on the SDLE website, which is sdle.case.edu slash T50 webinar. And if you have any additional questions or feedback on the content presented today or future directions of this research, please email Roger French at rxf131 at case.edu. And thank you again for your